So that takes us to Quake. What was the leap there? What was some fascinating technical challenges and there were a lot, or not challenges, but innovations that you've come up with? So Quake was kind of the first thing where I did have to kind of come face to face with the, my limitations, where it was the first thing where I really did kind of give it my all and still come up a little, you know, come up a little bit short in terms of what and when I wanted to, to get it done. And yeah. the company ran, had some serious stresses through the the whole project and we, uh, we bit off a lot. So the things that we set out to do was it was going to be really a true 3d engine where it could do six degree of freedom. You could have all the, all the viewpoints you could model anything. It had, a really remarkable new lighting model with the the surface caching and things. That was one of those where it was starting to to do some things that they weren't doing even on the very high end systems, uh, and it was going to be completely programmable uh, in the modding standpoint. Where the thing that you couldn't do in Doom, you could replace almost all of the media, but you couldn't really change the game. Uh, there were still some people that were doing the hex editing of the executable, the dehacked things where you could change a few things about rules and people made some early capture the flag type things by hacking the executable, but it wasn't really set out to do that. Quake was going to have its own programming language that the game was going to be implemented in it, and that would be able to be overwritten just like any of the media. Code was going to be data for that, and you would be able to have expansion packs that changed fundamental things and mods and so on. And the... The multiplayer was going to be playable over the internet. It was going to support a uh, client server rather than peer to peer. So we had the possibility of supporting larger numbers of players in disparate locations mm -hmm. with this full flexibility of the, the programming overrides with full six degree of freedom modeling and viewing and with this fancy new light mapped uh, kind of surface caching side. It was a lot. And this was one of those things that if I could go back and tell, I uh, you know, tell younger me to do something differently, it would have been to split those innovations up into two phases in two separate games. What would be phase one and phase two? So it probably would have been taking the Doom rendering engine and bringing in uh, the TCP/IP uh, client server, We're focusing on the multiplayer on the and one. the uh, the Quake C or would have been Doom C programming language there. So I would have split that into programming language and networking with the same Doom engine mm -hmm. rather than. Forcing everybody to go towards the the pen, you know, the Quake engine, which really meant getting a Pentium. You know, while it ran on a 486, it was not a great experience there. We could have made more people happier and gotten two games done in 50% more time. I uh, so speaking of people happier, our mutual friend Joe Rogan, it seems like his the the most important uh, moment of his life is is uh centered around Quake. So is it was a definitive um part of his life. So would he agree with your uh, thinking that they should split? Uh, so he, as a person who loves Quake and played Quake a lot, would he agree that you should have done the Doom engine with, and focus on the multiplayer for phase one? Uh, or in your looking back, it, is, is the, the, the 3D world that Quake created was also fundamental to the, the enriching so I experience? Would, you know, I would say that what would have happened is you would have had a a doom looking but quake feeling uh, game eight months earlier, and then maybe six months after Quake actually shipped, then there would have been the full running on a Pentium, I am six degree of freedom graphics engine type mm -hmm. things there. So it's not that it wouldn't have it wouldn't have been there. It would have been something amazingly cool earlier, and then something even cooler somewhat later, where. I would much rather in, have gone and done two one-year development efforts, uh, cycle them through, I uh, be a little more pragmatic about that rather than killing us uh, ourselves on the whole Quake development. But I would say it's obviously things worked out well in the end, but looking back and saying, how would I optimize and do things differently? That did seem to be a clear case where I... Uh, Going ahead, and we had enormous momentum on Doom. You know, we did Doom 2 as the uh, kind of commercial boxed version after our shareware uh, success with the original. But we could have just made another Doom game, adding those new features in. It would have been huge. We would have learned all the same lessons, but faster. And it would have given 
six degree of freedom and Pentium class systems a little bit more time to get mainstream because we did cut out a lot of people with uh, the hardware requirements for Quake. Was there any dark moments for you personally, psychologically, in having um, in um, having such harsh deadlines and having to solve so many difficult technical challenges? So I've never really had really dark black places. I mean, I it, I can't necessarily put myself in anyone else's shoes, but I understand a lot of people have you know, have significant challenges with kind of their their mental health and well-being and I've been I've been super stressed, I've been, you know, unhappy as a teenager in various ways, but I've never I've never really gone to a, a very dark place. I just seem to be largely immune to what really wrecks people. I mean, I've had plenty of time when I'm very unhappy and miserable about something, but it's never hit me like, you know, I believe it winds up hitting some other people. I've borne up well under whatever stresses have, I, you know, have kind of fallen on me. And I've always coped best on that when all I need to do is, is usually just kind of bear down on my work. I, I pull myself out of whatever hole I might be slipping into by actually making progress. I, I mean, maybe if I was in a position where I was never able to make that progress, I could have slid down further, but yeah. I've always been in a place where, okay, a little bit more work, maybe I'm in a tough spot here, but I, I always know if I just keep pushing, eventually I break through and I make progress, I feel good about what I'm doing. I, and that's been enough for me so far in my life. Have you seen in, in the distance, uh, like... Um you know, ideas of depression or contemplating suicide. Have you seen those things far? So it was interesting when, when I was a teenager, I was, you know, I, I was probably on some level a troubled youth. I was unhappy most of my teenage, uh, you know, years. I, you know, I really, I wanted to be on my own doing programming all the time. I, you know, as soon as I was 18, 19, even though I was poor, I was doing exactly what I wanted and I was very happy, but high school was not a great time for me. And I I had a conversation with like the school counselor and they're kind of running their script. It's like, okay, it's kind of a weird kid here. Let's carefully probe around. It's like, you know, do you ever think about ending it all? I'm like, no, of course not. Never, not at all. I this is temporary. Things are going to be better. I'm wow. and and that's always been kind of the case for me. And obviously that's not that way for everyone. And other people do react differently. And what was your um what was your escape from the troubled youth? Like, uh, uh, you know, music, uh, video games, books. How did yeah. you escape from a world that's full of cruelty and suffering and that's absurd? Yeah, I mean, I, I was not, you know, I was not a victim of cruelty and suffering. It's like I was an unhappy, somewhat petulant youth, and, you know, in my yes. point where, I, you know, I'm not putting myself up with anybody else's suffering, but I was unhappy objectively. And I, the things that I, I did that very much characterized my childhood were I had I, books, comic books, Dungeons and Dragons, arcade games, video games. Like some of my, my fondest childhood memories are the convenience stores, the 7-Elevens and Quick Trips, because they had a spinner rack of comic books and they had a little side room with two or three video games, arcade games in it. And that was, uh, that was very much my happy place. You know, if I could, I get my comic books and, uh, if I could go to a library and, you know, go through those, the little zero, zero, zero section where computer books were supposed to be. And there were a few sad little books there, but still just being able to sit down and go through that. And I read, you know, I read a, a ridiculous number of books, both fiction and nonfiction as a teenager. And I, you know, as I, my rebel, my rebelling in high school was just sitting there with my nose in a book, ignoring the class uh, through lots of it. And teachers had a, a range of reactions to that. Some more, uh, more accepting of it than others. I'm with you on that. So let us return to Quake for a bit with the technical challenges. What, what, um, everything together from the, from the networking to the, the graphics, what, what are some things you remember that were, that were innovations you had to come up with in order to make it all happen. Yeah, so there were a bunch of things on Quake where, on the one hand, the idea that I built my own programming language to implement the game in, looking back, and I try to tell people, it's like every 
every high-level programmer sometime in their career goes through and they invent their own language. It just seems to be a thing that's pretty broadly done. People will be like, I'm going to go write a computer programming language. Yeah. And I, you know, I don't regret having done it, but after that, I, I switched from Quake C, my quirky little uh, pseudo-object oriented or entity-oriented language there. Quake 2 went back to using DLLs with C, and then Quake 3, I implemented my own C interpreter or compiler, which was a much smarter thing to do that I should have done originally for Quake. But building my own language was an experience. I learned a lot from that. Um, and then there was a generation of game programmers that learned programming with Quake C, which I feel kind of bad about because... You know, I mean, we give JavaScript a lot of crap, but I, you know, Quake C was nothing to write home about there. Uh, but it was it allowed people to do magical things. You get into programming not because you love the, you know, the BNF syntax of a language. It's because the language lets you do something that you cared about. And, and here's <laughs> very much you could do something in a whole beautiful three dimensional yeah, world. And the idea and the fact that the code for the game was out there, you could say. I like the shotgun, but I want it to be more badass. You go in there and say, okay, now it does 200 points damage. And then yeah. you go around with a big grin on your face, blowing up monsters all over the yeah. game. So yeah, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it is not uh, what I would do today going back with that language, but that was a big part of it. Learning about the networking stuff. I, because it's interesting where I learned these things by reading books. So I would get a book on networking, find something I read all about it and learn, okay, packets, they can be, you know, out of order or lost uh, or duplicated. These are all the things that can theoretically happen to packets. So I wind up spending all this time thinking about how do we deal about all of that? And it turns out, of course, in the real world, those are things that, yes, theoretically can happen with multiple routes, but they really aren't things that your 99.999% of your packets have to deal with. I am... Um, so there was learning experiences about uh, lots of that and like why when TCP is appropriate versus UDP and and how if you do things in UDP, you wind up reinventing TCP badly in almost all cases. So, you know, there's there's good arguments for using both for different game technology, different parts of the game process, transitioning from level to level and all. But the uh, the graphics were the showcase of what what Quake was all about. It was this graphics technology that nobody had seen there. And it was a while before, you know, there were competitive things out there. And it went a long time internally really not working, where we were even building levels where uh, the game just was not at all shippable with large fractions of the world, like disappearing, not being there, uh, or being really slow in uh, various parts of it. And it was this act of faith. It's like, I think I'm going to be able to fix this. I think I'm going to be able to make this work. Uh, and... Lots of stuff changed where the level designers would build something and then have to throw it away as something fundamental and the, the kind of graphics or level technology changed. And the uh, so there were two big things that contributed to making it possible at that time frame. I am um, two new things. There was certainly hardcore optimized low-level assembly language. And this was where I had hired Michael A. Brash away from Microsoft. And he had been one of my early inspirations where that back in the soft disk days, the library of magazines that they had, uh, some of my most treasured ones were Michael A. Brash's uh, articles in Dr. Dobbs' journal. And it was it was amazing after all of our success in Doom, we were able to kind of hit him up and say, hey, we'd like you to come work at id Software. And he was in this senior technical role at Microsoft. And I am, you know, and he was on track for, and this was right when Microsoft was starting to take off. And I did eventually you know, convince him that what we were doing was going to be really amazing with Quake. It was going to, it was going to be something nobody had seen before. It had these aspects of what we were talking about. We had Metaverse talk back then. We, mm -hmm. you know, we had read Snow Crash and we were, we knew about this and uh, Michael was, I uh, was big into the science fiction and we would talk about all that and kind of spin this tale. And it was some of the same conversations that we have today about the metaverse, about how you could have different areas linked together by portals and you could have user-generated content and changing out all of these things. So you really and, were creating the metaverse with Quake. And we, we like talked the, about the, things like Philosophically. Doom used to be advertised as a virtual reality experience. Mm -hmm. You know, that was the first wave of virtual reality was in the late 80s and early 90s, you had like the Lawnmower Man I, you know, movie and you had Time and Newsweek talking about the early VPL headsets. And of course, that cratered so hard that people didn't want to look at virtual reality for decades afterwards, where 
Uh, it was just, it was smoke and mirrors. It was not real in the sense that you could actually do something real and valuable with it. But uh, but still, we had that kind of common set of talking points, and we were talking about what these games could uh, could become and how you'd like to see people building all of these creative things. Because we were seeing an explosion of work with Doom at that time, where people were doing amazingly cool things. Like we saw cooler levels than we had built coming out of the user community and then people finding ways to, you know, change the the characters in different ways. And it was great. And we knew what we were doing in Quake was removing those last things. There was some quirky things with a couple of the data types that didn't work right for overriding. And then, and then the core thing about the programming model. And I was definitely going to hit all of those in Quake. I'm but the the graphics side of it was um it was still i knew what i wanted to do and it was one of these hubris things where it's like well so far i've been able to kind of kick everything that i set out to go do uh but quake was definitely a little bit more than could be comfortably chewed at that point and uh but michael was one of the one of the strongest programmers and graphics programmers that I knew. And he was one of the people that I trusted to, to write assembly code, you know, better than I could. And there's, there's a few people that I can point to about things like this, where I'm a world-class optimizer. I mean, I make things go fast, but I recognize there's a number of people that can write tighter assembly code, tighter SIMD code or tighter CUDA code than, you know, than I can write. I am, you know, my best strengths are, a little bit more at the system level. I mean, I'm good at all of that, but the most leverage comes from making the decisions that are a little bit higher up where you figure out how to change your large scale problems so that these lower level problems are easier to do or it makes it possible to do them in a um, in a uniquely fast way. So most of my you know, my big wins in a lot of ways from all the way from the early games through, you know, through VR and the aerospace work that I'm doing and or did and hopefully the AI work that I'm working on now is finding an angle on something that means you trade off something that you maybe think you need, but it turns out you don't need. And by making a sacrifice in one place, you can get big advantages in another place. Is it clear at which level of the system those big advantages can be gained? It's not always clear. And that's why the thing that that I try to make one of my core values, and I, I proselytize to a lot of people, is trying to know the entire stack, you know, trying to see through everything that happens. And it's almost impossible on like the web browser level of things where there's so many levels to it. But you should at least understand what they all are, even if you can't understand all the performance characteristics at each level. But it goes all the way down to literally the hardware. So what does the what is this chip capable of? And what is this software that you're writing capable of? And then what this architecture you put on top of that, then the ecosystem around it, all the people that are that are working on it. So there are there are all these decisions, and they're never made in a globally optimal way. But sometimes you can drive a thread of global optimality through it. You can't look at everything, it's too complicated. But sometimes you can step back up and make a different decision. And we kind of went through this on the graphics side on Quake, where I, you know, in some ways it was kind of bad where Michael would spend his time writing. Like I'd, I'd rough out the basic routines, like, okay, here's our span rasterizer. And he would spend a month writing this you know, beautiful cycle-optimized uh, piece of assembly language that does you know, does what I asked it to do and he did it faster than like my original code would do or probably what I would be able to do even if I had spent that month on it. Uh, but then we'd have some cases when I'd be like, okay, well, I figured out at this higher level, instead of drawing these in a painter's order here, I do a span buffer and it cuts out 30% or 40% of all of these pixels but it means you need to rewrite kind of this interface of all of that. And I could tell that war on him a little bit, but in the end it was it was the right thing to do where we wound up changing that rasterization approach and we wound up with a super optimized assembly language uh, core loop and then a good system around it, which minimized how much that had to be called. And so in order to be able to do this kind of system level thinking, whether we're talking about uh, game development, aerospace, nuclear energy, AI, VR, you have to be able to understand the hardware, the low level software, the high level software, the design decisions, the whole thing, the, the, the full stack of it. 
Yeah. And that's where a lot of these things become possible. When you're really, when you're bringing the future forward, I mean, there's a pace that everything just kind of glides towards where we have a lot of progress that's happening at such a different, so many different ways. You kind of slide towards progress just left to your own. Programs just get faster. For a while, it wasn't clear if they were going to get fatter more than they get quicker than they get faster and it cancels yeah. out. But it is clear now in retrospect, no, programs just get faster and have gotten faster for a long time. But if you want to do something like back at that original uh, talking about scrolling games, say, what well, this needs to be five times faster. Well, we can wait six years and just it'll naturally get that much faster at that time. Or you come up with some really clever way of doing it. So there are those opportunities like that in a whole bunch of different areas. Now, most programmers don't need to, to be thinking about that. There's not that many, you know, there's a lot of opportunities for this, but it's not everyone's workaday type stuff. So everyone doesn't have to know how all these things work. They don't have to know how their compiler works, how, you know, the processor chip manages cache eviction and all these low-level things. But sometimes there are powerful opportunities that you can look at and say, we can bring the future five years faster. You know, we can do something that, wouldn't it be great if we could do this? Well, we can do it today if we make a certain set of decisions. And it is, in some ways, smoke and mirrors where you say it's like, Doom was a lot of smoke and mirrors where people thought it was more capable than it actually was, but we picked the right smoke and mirrors to deploy in the game where by doing this, people will think that it's more general. If we are going to amaze them with what they've got here, and they won't notice that it doesn't do these other things. So smart decision making at that point, that's where that, that kind of global, holistic, top-down view uh, can work. And I'm, I'm really a strong believer that technology should be sitting at that table having those discussions because you do have cases where you say, well, you want to be the Jonathan Ivy or whatever, where it's a, a pure design solution. And that's, I, in some cases now, where you truly have almost infinite resources, like if you're trying to do a, a scrolling game on the PC now, you don't even have to talk to a technology person. You can just have, uh, you know, any intern can make that go run as fast as it needs to there, and it can be completely design-based. But if you're trying to do something that's hard, either that can't be done for resources like VR on a mobile chipset, or that we don't even know how to do yet, like artificial general intelligence, it's probably going to be a matter of coming at it from an angle. Like, I mean, for AGI, we have some of like some of the Hutter principles about how you can, you know, AXI or uh, some of the, there are theoretical ways that you can say this is the optimal learning algorithm that can solve everything, but it's completely impractical. You know, you just can't do that. So clearly you have to make some concessions for general intelligence and nobody knows what the right ones are yet. So people are taking different angles of attack. I hope I've got something clever to come up with uh, in that space. It's been surprising to me, and I think it, perhaps it is a principle of progress that smoke and mirrors somehow is the way you build the future. You kind of you kind of fake it till you make it, and you almost always make it. And I think that's going to be the way we achieve AGI. That's going to be the way we build uh, consciousness into our machines. Is um, there's you know philosophers debate about the Turing test is essentially about faking it till you make it. You start by faking it, and I think that always leads to making it. Yeah. Uh, because Most if of the we look at history, arguments when as soon as people start talking about qualia and consciousness and Chinese rooms and things, it's like I just check out. I just don't think there's any value in those conversations. It's just like, go ahead, tell me it's not going to work. I'm going to do my best to try to make it work anyways. I don't know if you work with legged robots or a bunch of these. Um, they they make they sure as heck make me feel like they're conscious uh, in a certain way that's not here today, but is um, you could see the kernel, yeah. it's like uh, the, the 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 flame, the beginnings of a flame. We don't have line of sight, but there's <laughs> glimmerings of light in the distance for all of these things. Yeah, I'm hearing murmuring in a yeah. distant room. 